working his way up the ladder with his natural talent. So what a treat to have you back in the Bay, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. It's great to be here. 13 years in, uh, in the Valley, and now I'm in Los Angeles, but uh, it's always a pleasure to come back to the city. Well, and, and we're happy to have you, and I'm happy to have you start cooking, and then we get to hear a little bit more about the filmmaker's work, too. And what I love about this, as we're talking about a butcher, is that you've chosen to do something totally out of the box for most of us today. But what are you making? I'm going to be making a partridge jambonet um, that's stuffed with a little bit of sour Michigan cherries, and it'll be served with the parsnip puree and then Guinness chocolate emulsion. I mean, just a little something that he threw <laughs> together. I'm like, yeah, this is what I make at my home every night. And we're going to serve it with the Glenfiddich scotch that you have that's 14-year aged, which should be a really interesting pairing as well. Yeah, it should be. Yeah. I, think this, I think the smokiness from the scotch with the cherries and the chocolate and then game birds is our, its obvious choice. Well, well, it's, I can't wait to hear a little bit more, too. I think people hear Partridge and they're intimidated by it. But he told me, what did you tell me that we're really eating today? We're going to be making chicken nuggets. So that's <laughs> essentially it. So. Just, you know, <laughs> chicken, slightly <laughs> elevated chicken nugget. Oh, my gosh. So will you share with us, what are you, what are you doing here? And uh, Partridge versus quail and understanding what this bird is. Yeah, I think um, for me, the, you know, the choice is about what's the best quality meat that you can get. And you can kind of, you can make this with really anything that you wanted. Um, ultimately, I chose, chose parsnip in there. And I actually added a little bit of duck confit in there as well, um, just because the partridge came in smaller than I thought they were going to. Um, and as a chef, that's something that you're always constantly having to do is really just adapting in any sort of situation that you're in. Right. But partridge to me has, um, I think, you know, chicken is a very neutral bird. Quail has a little bit more character to it. Um, duck, guinea hen, partridge, like um, you can even get into like grouse or, you know, even even these sort of like ortolan and like these uh, exotic kind of things. But um, partridge has a distinct flavor, has a decent amount of flavor. It's something that you actually don't cook all the way through. It's, mm -hmm. it's something you're not cooking like a, as much as you would chicken and stuff like that. Right. But it's a, it's a very fun sort of bird to be able to cook. Wow. So how do you go about doing this? <laughs> how do you start so, this recipe? Um, essentially what I'm going to show you is sort of the butchering process of of this okay. um, so the butchering process that uh, I like to to use is sort of just taking taking apart the um, the sort of the the leg and the thigh mm -hmm. off of off of the bird um, once that's off the bird what I what I did with that is I sort of cured it um, in a little bit of salt um, a little bit of herbs garlic and thyme um, on a sheet tray, okay. um, and then I, I braised it. Wow. Um, or you can confit it, either one. Right. Um, I take the skin off of the the breast on the par uh, partridge mm -hmm. because uh, we don't we don't necessarily want that as far as um, in the in the chicken nugget, if you will. Okay, I was. It's not a flavor thing; it's a texture thing. You don't want it ground up for the nugget. Yeah, you don't. Okay. You don't want it. You could. You could, but to to make it a sort of like cleaner version of it, I I chose not to. Okay. Um, right. But essentially, I'm just going to take take the meat off of it, and uh -huh. then I'm going to dice it up, and then I'm going to make a puree with okay. it. Okay. Um, but, you know, butchering, butchering birds is something that I think everybody should get used to at the house because mm -hmm. um, it's, it's actually a very easy thing. And one of my favorite things to make at home is a roasted chicken. So um, if people get kind of in the habit, I think people get intimidated with that. Um, but, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up. Yeah. Everybody should be ready to, to carve a turkey. Exactly. I'm thinking this would be the perfect bird to practice on. <laughs> They're small and yes. not that much waste. Well. And on that note, while you're doing this, I would just love to hear a little bit more from Gabby or Angela, if you'd like, about the story behind the film. It's fascinating. And Angela's story is really inspiring. So, Gabby, if you want to share a little? Um, for, for sure, of course. Um, so I, um, I've always been interested in um, stories, I think, that circulate around food. Um, I originally, I wrote my grad thesis about molecular gastronomy and I was looking at different chefs like Rene Redzepi at Noma. Um, and so I was always kind of drawn to that. Um, and then getting into more video editing, I was looking at a story that I could personally tell with film uh, and visually tell that. Um, and I had heard about Angela, I knew about her through community. She is an owner and butcher of Avedano's Butcher Shop in San Francisco. Um, and I, I approached her and I was just like, you know, I think it's really interesting that you're a female butcher. You often don't see that. It's just not a story we hear about. Uh, so on, on one level, I was interested in learning more about, you know, what is the fundamental thing about butchery and 
processing meat um, and where does it come from and I didn't know that much about it. And then just on another level, I was really curious to hear what her perspective was um, as, a, as a female business owner um, and also as a female butcher and kind of like what, what kind of different story that lended itself to. So um, if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> you, she found an amazing storyteller. But Angela, I, I found after I saw this film and I don't know what, is it screening again today or tomorrow? Do you know? I believe it's um, tomorrow night at the okay. farmstead and then okay. on Saturday night as well. Okay. Yeah. I just found myself, I was lucky enough to see this. I only got to see a couple of them and I found myself wanting to ask Angela why, because she puts so much time and energy and love into the work she does every day. And it's just a really, really demanding career. And it's one of the few places left, I feel like, where, you know, individuals are choosing to run this business and, and they do it because they love it and they want to bring this incredible product to people every day. So... I don't know if Angela wants to say anything about that, but she's known in her community and in Bernal Heights in the city as really everyone knows her and they go because it's her and because she is the best at what she does. So um, love that you're highlighted that way. Yeah. No. <laughs> I think she doesn't have to talk. We could <laughs> just to add to that too. Just something that came across um, that she told me about, and we had a series of interviews throughout mm -hmm. the whole process. Um, so it kind of was very casual, kind of getting to know like what she was interested in talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and a huge thing that came up was this idea of like our value systems. You know, like right. where are we getting our food from, and why should we care? Um, and then going to you know having a local source for that, mm -hmm. as opposed to Whole Foods or mm -hmm. you know Buy Right or some other bigger stores. Like there's a lot that she personally cares about you know these farms and people that she's supporting which is so great and i i think we're so lucky to be here in the bay because we have access to these incredible farms we were talking about posy ranch earlier and we have places being able to bring them to us and she's able to do that for us as well which is crazy so yeah. i have to ask too how do you source partridge chef um, <laughs> i'm like well this is the first time i've seen it it's it's tough to get it in the, in the states sometimes uh -huh. um we get it from dartania um which is a pretty popular uh, place I believe you can order it as um, not if you're not in a restaurant and uh -huh. you can order it um, okay. online. But ultimately, um, you know, it's a it's a this is a product that's coming from Scotland, um, and it's a it's a highly regarded product over there. I think in England, Scotland, Ireland, um, you have a lot more people using sort of the game birds and whatnot. Right. Um, so it's 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 a fun product for us to be able to use, especially in the sort of the heritage of of kind of butchery and 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 cooking and and um, what what chefs and traditional chefs have used in the past. Uh, that's what's kind of interesting to me, and we'll talk a little bit too. About about your other restaurant. Um, tell me about the restaurant, C.J. Boyd's, did you say? That's yeah. for fried chicken. Yeah, so I just opened a restaurant called C.J. Boyd's uh, in downtown Los Angeles as well. It's a restaurant that uh, is named after my grandpa. My grandfather um, would go, he was, a, he was a mailman, and would go and uh, get fried chicken on like payday. <laughs> um, so we have uh, a, a fried chicken in sort of homage to, to him and, and um, kind of my family. So. It's, it's essentially uh, fried chicken sandwiches. We offer five different kinds. Um, we have a dessert. It's my grandma's banana pudding recipe. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Who doesn't want that meal? So uh, Cecil, Cecil Boyd, my grandfather, um, the, it's, uh, he's from Texas, and uh, he's, uh, it's a modeled after like a southern kind of fried chicken style. But the, all the different flavors that we use in, in the fried chicken format are uh, flavors that are American. Um, and I think that American food, it's, it's very important for us to sort of acknowledge all the different cultures that we have here um, and how food has kind of changed and pe uh, people and cultures have adapted to um, what really um, American food is. So, if, you know, if you're Chinese and you moved over here, if you're, um, if you're uh, Mexican and you, and you moved here, if, wherever, wherever the immigrants might have been from, um, those people have adapted their cuisine mm -hmm. to be um, to be what is now Chinese American cuisine or mm -hmm. or what is just you know American cuisine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have an East LA which is inspired by Mexican food, which has like salsa matcha. We have a Malibu one, which is um, really kind of just fresh, sort of um, based on California products. That's like, fun. Yeah, um, we have a Korean one, which is based off of Korean chicken wings. Wow. Um, we have a buffalo one because uh, everybody loves buffalo fried chicken. <laughs> 
And uh, yeah, it's it's a it's been a fun project for me. Uh, I think as you know, coming from like the fine dining world, right? Kind of moving into, um, I'm you know still very connected to it, but really kind of trying to stay stay approachable. I mean, go back to sort of my roots and how I grew up. And I think that's an exciting, exciting thing. And it's how, it's how I was raised. And yeah. I like to celebrate that. You know? Yeah. And I think that what I think is so fun about today is you're taking something that's so elevated and you're bringing it, it turning it into something so approachable. He tells you a chicken nugget, you know, and the whole world's going to want to eat it and try it. But the fact you're trying the partridge instead of regular chicken, I mean, it's just got some really interesting things in it. So how fun for you to be able to use your creativity as a chef and kind of play in both worlds today. Yeah, absolutely. It's I mean, really the nice. base the base of it is um, of a chicken nugget is kind of if you think about like how they mass produce it and stuff like that. If you ever watch the videos online, it's not a it's not, it's a very, not pretty. Yeah, it's not <laughs> a very pretty picture. They're kind of dumping a bunch in, of stuff inside of it, but that doesn't mean that like the origin of it is 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 not good either. You right. can make like chicken tenders, or yeah. you can make something like like this that we're going to be making. So um, I'll show you how to make it in just a second, but just kind of walk you through it. Sure. It's just like diced up chicken, and okay. then um, I'll be adding. Uh, a cure to it. So this is a little bit of a salt, pink salt, and potato starch. Um, a little bit of polyphosphate as well. Polyphosphate kind of helps um, emulsify everything. It uh, allows you to add uh, more liquid and fat into something. And, and, and it'll uh, thicken faster? Or yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll emulsify better? If you think about it like a hot dog, you're able to pump a bunch of stuff uh -huh. into a little about amount of meat. <laughs> but it's not necessarily, we're not. that's not exactly what we're trying to do. We're just trying to be able to put more fat into it. Got it. Um, and fat being cream and a little bit of creme fraiche. So it's not, not a tremendous amount. And then we're going to sweeten it up with a little bit of, uh, of cherry here that we poached in, uh, in a red wine, red wine, like a port wine poaching liquid. Wow. Um, we'll bind that all together and then we'll dredge it and then and, and fry it. But I think it, it really pairs nicely. At the end of the day, it's, it's, it's essentially a chicken nugget. Yeah. And then what, what uh, the cool part about it is I think what we pair it with. So we're pairing it with a parsnip puree and then the Guinness chocolate emulsion. That Guinness <laughs> chocolate and the cherries, I think with the, uh, with the, with the, with the scotch really, really uh, kind of balances it out. I guess that's what I'm curious about too. I hear Guinness chocolate emulsion and I hear cherries and red wine and how how do you know to pair this with the scotch? I'm blown away by this. I mean, I think, you know, to me, scotch is a, it's a strong, uh, strong spirit. It has, a, you know, the peatiness, the smokiness aspect of it um, can get a little bit intense sometimes. Uh -huh. um, a lot of people will drink it straight. Um, some people will drink it on the rocks or whatever. A little bit of dilution with water. Right. Um, so uh, to me, adding, everything is about balance, right? If you're, if you're drinking wine with food, you're sort of trying to balance uh, the acidity in something or, um, you know, you're not pairing the same flavor profiles in wine with the food. You want mm -hmm. something that balances that. Mm -hmm. So for me, with the smokiness of this and the, the heaviness of it and, the, um, you know, the, the, the body that it has, I think the sweetness and then that, that, that kind of bitterness from the chocolate helps round it out wow. a lot. I can't wait to see what you all think. It's going to be a really interesting combination of flavors. Did you guys, some of you get it already? <laughs> So you're just going to pulse the chicken, which again, I think people think chopping, you've got to do it with a knife. This is great to do in a Cuisinart. Just yeah, pulse sure. it and you can get any texture that you want. Yeah. The, I mean, I think the most, the most important thing is just to make sure that it's cold throughout this process. Right. Um, I noticed you chilled the bowl. Yeah. You yeah. Ch yeah. We chilled the bowl. I got, even got the bowl that we'll potentially paddle into depending on how it works in here. Right. Um, but, you know, making sure that all your products are really cold. If, if not, you're going to break the emulsification. Um, emulsification is a tricky thing when you cook, but it's actually a very simple thing if you if you can do kind of an elementary thing like make making mayonnaise like making mayonnaise is an elementary sort of emulsion um, or making a hollandaise and then I think that if you if you make that at home and mm -hmm. you get get kind of comfortable with that then you sort of understand the basics of emulsification mm -hmm. um, so any any sort of complex emulsification this is a more complex emulsification I always equate it back to a mayonnaise and like you know the, the balancing of the temperature is very important the balancing of the fat how slow you add it if you mm -hmm. add oil fast to a mayonnaise your mayonnaise will either break or it's going to be thinner than you want it to be. So making sure that emulsification is 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 great is is really important. I made a joke that this is why we'll continue to go to his restaurants because you're working all the magic for us, right? It's really nice to have you doing this. It's fast. 
Yeah, so what, what we're trying to do here is we really want to make it hydrate. Yeah. So just a few minutes of uh, being able to kind of work that a polyphosphate. Polyphosphate works by the activation of it. So it needs to, it needs to really be incorporated before you start to add different things to it. And if we didn't have polyphosphate at home, what would we do? <laughs> you don't really you don't really need it. Um, you can just add less fat. Okay. Yeah. I'm really curious to see how this comes together. Is this something where you could make the mixture in advance and then fry it off later too? Or will that mess with the texture of the chicken or the partridge? It's actually better if you do it in advance. Okay, um, and you, you can just let it chill? Yeah, you kind of want it to, to set up. You can, okay. see the, you can see the emulsification, how it's kind of happened here. Wow. Um, that emulsification. Um, is really, really nice. I mean, you could, you could take this and you can refine it as much as you want. Yeah. Um, at the French Laundry, you would have passed this to a Tammy. Oh, my and, gosh. And, you know, been left with, fine, like, fine, a lot fine. of different, like, the, the sinew and stuff out of the chicken. But, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really need, need that necessarily. Um, it's, it's nice with, um, with a little bit of texture, especially when we're adding in more meat to that. So okay. um, even, even this, the chicken skin and whatnot, or the partridge skin, uh -huh. is not, a, not necessarily a negative thing. And that's creme fraiche? Yeah, or that's so a little okay. bit of creme fraiche. So just for the tang? Yeah. You like I, it? I love the acidity. Right. Um, I think I just got used to using it for so long, but yeah. you could use straight up cream if you wanted to. Okay. Um, you could use sour cream if you wanted to as well. Um, really any of that stuff. And then where will this come into the picture? It so that's going to be added next. Okay. We'll add two different things next. One will be... Um, one is going to be the sour Michigan cherries. Wow. So we'll add that in there. And That's... then the next thing is going to be the, the duck confit. Mm. Delicious. I think the thing that's interesting, every time I meet a new chef, I learn something new. And I'm watching the flavors that you're combining, and it's fascinating. Like, even if I weren't going to do this and do this crazy cool preparation at home, why can't I take chicken with a cream sauce and a Michigan dried cherry and do something like that and make it easier for me to do myself, right? Yeah, I mean, this is actually something, like, legitimately that I make for my kids. Do you really? Um, not necessarily with the chocolate sauce and the cherries <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, chicken nuggets is something that I grew up on. Right. Um, Probably not the best version of that, sure, <laughs> sure. to be honest. But you know, I do think that it's a you know it's a it's a good um, food, and kids do like it. Right. And you can make it. You know, the the fact is that you know it's sort of all all the mass produced food and stuff like that is kind of based on you know legitimate food. And this is you know this is a, this is a kind of a French recipe for all intents and purposes. And a grown up version of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it still uh, pays homage to the roots, and it's going to be going to have that comfort food feeling to it, which I love. I'm also curious at your butcher shop, Angela, what are people looking to buy these days? I feel like we've become more educated around the pieces of meat and different things we want. But what do you see people asking for? <laughs> Can you hear her? Oh, is it flipped on? Can you hear me? Oh, now? there we go. <laughs> um, it seems like people are interested in the lesser cuts of meat, like short ribs, um, brisket. Um, now, instead of selling short ribs, we sell uh, beef shanks, just because the price is lower. So right. Everybody being into short ribs or uh, the, the lesser cuts the drives the price up <laughs> when restaurants want them. So. We always have to find something different to recommend. Um, boneless short ribs. I like lamb neck. Uh, we do a whole animal butchery, so yeah. we always have to have something uh, different to offer people if we run out of, let's say, lamb shanks. Or, right. Um, so Are they becoming more open-minded to the other cuts? Not so much. I no. mean, everybody, <laughs> everybody no. still wants ribeyes, New right. Yorks. Right. You know, if I try to sell them a Denver steak, they're suspicious. <laughs> um, <laughs> a Denver steak is a small part of the chuck that is probably, if a chuck weighs about 20 pounds, it's about a pound and a half of the wow. chuck meat that is a good griller steak. Yeah. Um, there's so many different small cuts of beef from a cow that are wonderful that usually get caught and grind um, mm -hmm. from mass production. But mostly what I'd like to impart on you guys is to support your local butcher shops mm -hmm. and local farmers. 
especially in California, it's difficult uh, with the drought and with the cost of labor and the cost of land and the cost of water. Uh, we won't have small butcher shops and farms if people don't want to pay the money for it. And if you want to tell yourself by going to big supermarkets that you're doing it, you're not. Um, plain and simple. You should know the name of your farmers and where you're getting stuff, or choose not to eat meat. And I think that that's a fine alternative, too. So I always say pay more, eat less. That's and if great. you're paying too cheap, there's something wrong at the yeah. end of the day. You know what? It's, it's so important to, to hear that, but it's true. And I love your, uh, to hear a butcher say just eat less meat or don't eat meat. But I think it's really important to know where it's coming from. And so we're lucky to have people reminding us us of that and making it easier to access things so oh, we have a question yeah no. yeah how did you get into this I just was a, a food cook and I've been self-employed since I was 25 and just happened upon this <laughs> old butcher shop and had a really stupid idea one day and have been working at it really hard for 12 years and learning on the job. She invested, that's pretty amazing, yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah. I'm watching you, chef, <laughs> throw in these dried Michigan sour cherries that you've infused with red wine? What'd yeah. you do? Yeah, okay. port, port wine. Port, um, okay. Yeah, and then uh, before that I added egg whites in there mm -hmm. and just sort of beat, beat them up a little bit okay. and emulsified it in. Wow. Um, and you can see the texture of it now. Um, whenever you whenever you see the texture like this and it kind of like is really, really firm, uh -huh. um, that means you have like a pretty good emulsification. That means the polyphosphate is working. Um, and then the next step would be is to really like just refrigerate this and, and uh, let it kind of set overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and then to be able to roll it into, into your balls. And then we did the, the breading process for this. So the breading process was um, just taking a little bit of flour, kind of dredging it in there, and then egg whites, um, or sorry, eggs um, with a little bit of cream, salt, and then uh, dipping it in a panko here. And panko crumbs. Gorgeous. Yeah. It's almost like sausage. I mean, you could just, could you pat this out and fry it up in a pan as well? How would yeah. it taste? Good? Yeah, you could. It's, uh, <laughs> it's going like, to be more, it's be more like, a, um, <laughs> because we've added the eggs and stuff like that, uh -huh. it's going to be more meatloafish uh -huh. okay. than, than that. But uh, Heard. the emulsification of, of, of it is, is different than sausage, um, but similar, I guess, more similar to like a boudin. Okay. So now... To fry. Yes. <laughs> hey, somebody's, somebody's excited about that. <laughs> I love um, it. I mean, before that, I'd like to reiterate this. Uh, that I think that the, the importance of the butcher shops is, um, is really, really great. I think having a relationship with anybody that you can get the, your produce from is, is um, really incredible. Any, any product, whether it be you know, your vegetables, your fish, um, it's, it's kind of... It's, it's really, we're going back in time. Everybody used to do that a long time ago. Right. And then, you know, so the industrialization of everything has kind of moved on. But uh, just to be able to go to a butcher shop, talk about the different cuts of meats, be educated. You know, if you said, hey, like lamb neck, how do I cook this? What am I supposed to do with this? Like, it's probably an intimidating piece of meat, but um, in all honesty, it's probably one of my favorite pieces of meat. It mm -hmm. has so much flavor. It has so much, like... Um, I remember when, uh, as a young cook, one of the first times I ever cooked lamb neck was just, um, just over the top of like cut up vegetables, sort of, sort of like mirepoix, and then roasting it in the oven overnight, and then pulling it out, and then uh, straining that off, and reducing down the cuisson or the cooking liquid, and then pouring it back over the pick lamb neck. And I was like, oh my god, this, this is like incredible. Best food ever. Yeah, really, really, really incredible. Right? Well, and. I always say, I'm sure that this is true in Angela's case, but people are so intimidated to walk in and ask questions of the butcher, but it's, that's your job. That's your life. That's what they love talking about. And so I always try to encourage people to go have that conversation or start the conversation, whether it's a fishmonger or a butcher, um, because they love to share their information and their knowledge with you. And you might learn some cool new technique or find a different cut that you never would have tried, which is always fun in cooking. So yeah, or different, or different vegetables if you're talking to your produce or uh -huh. whatever. It's, I, think it's in, I think it's incredible. It just being able to have that relationship with people and um, directly with farmers. I mean, th for me, one of the very first times was actually in this valley. And I think that the people in this valley are extremely educated um, because of, uh, as well as in Los Angeles now as well, because people, people 
like everyday people will go to the farmer's market and actually talk to the farmers that we are buying our, some of the meat from, some of the, obviously the produce and the fruits. Um, so it's, it's really incredible. And I don't think, I don't think people really understand how lucky they are. I oh, mean, I know. How many people are from the Bay Area who are here? How many from California? How many from out of state? <laughs> so I should be, wow, happy vacation, welcome. But I think it's very easy for us to take it for granted here because so many, th- we have such long growing seasons. Yes. We have access to so much right here in California. We're really, really lucky. And so I try not to take that for granted, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so are you gonna plate this fancy McNugget up? Yeah, what we're gonna What are you doing here? So this, this is, is the parsnip? the parsnip puree, yeah. Okay. So you're just gonna take a little bit of that. It's um, never looked so good. I'm going to plate it a little bit differently than maybe you guys had it because I don't have a spoon on me. But <laughs> <laughs> You're taking creative license, yes. right? And this is the Guinness chocolate. So the parsnip puree, just to talk you talk you through it, if you guys really enjoyed that, um, essentially that's just taking parsnips. You're peeling them, chopping them up uh, into probably like a one-inch size dice and then cooking it down, uh, cooking it down in a little bit of milk uh-huh. um, and a little bit of cream. Okay. Uh, when, once it's all the way down, and salt obviously, once it's all the way down making a puree, it's really difficult difficult to mess it up the only the only thing that would really mess it up is having too much liquid so if you're worried that you had too much liquid strain it off puree it and then um, add your liquid in, in, in sort of a gradual way. I like, I, I don't know if it's the starch content, but I like that parsnips, you can puree them and they don't get glutinous like a potato would. They don't break up the same way. I mm-hmm. love the texture of them. So I think they hold a little bit better too. And this sauce is uh, really like a, a dessert. Um, I, <laughs> I was like, oh. Um, and it's a, it's a very, oh, very God. simple sauce to make. Drink um, that. If you can find one of the ingredients that's difficult to get. Uh, but it's basically glucose, which is an ingredient that's hard to get. Yeah. And then it's cooked down with uh, cocoa powder and Guinness. Wow. Um, and it's extremely, extremely <laughs> simple. You just take those ingredients in. Um, you can balance it any sort of way you want. If we wanted to make it more bitter with chocolate and whatnot, we could. If we wanted to make it sweeter, we could. Um, but the bitterness with that, the bitterness in the, um, in, the, in the Guinness, I think it really, really kind of goes well and pairs with the smokiness that we have. Well, I'm relying on you to tell us how to put these things together. Have they? Have you all gotten to try it yet? What do you think? Interesting combination with the scotch as well. Yeah, people are clapping. <laughs> Chef, <laughs> I think that's a good sign, right? Yeah, thank you. And then John Bonnet, just so just so to clarify what John Bonnet means, John Bonnet is typically um, typically like uh, equal parts pork and bacon um, that would be ground up and sort of maybe stuffed inside the um, the leg of the leg of something or or a sort of pear shaped um, thing. So if you took like a rabbit leg and you and you and you stuff that, or um, it would that it's it's kind of referring to the shape. Um, this one, it's. it's it's sort of like a John Bonnet, like a play on words, yeah. because we're using the toothpick, um, <laughs> or the yeah, or you could be, you know, sometimes we take the bone and actually cut it up and then clean it, up, uh-huh. clean it really well, and then and put it inside there as well. Right. Um, but it's essentially, you know, it's a it's a very very approachable thing. This is something my, that my kids would eat at home, uh, and it's something that I think you can serve in a three Michelin star restaurant. So it has it has a lot of different layers, and ultimately, it's not that difficult to make. So. Um, I hope I hope you guys give it a shot. I, I <laughs> hope my kids aren't watching the live stream because they're going to say, he said you could make this at home. <laughs> so if you'd like to come over, uh, yeah, I'll come over and help. <laughs> but I love what you've done here. And um, uh, anybody have any questions for any of us? These are all fast learners. They're all, they're all fast learners. <laughs> They've all had their scotch. They're settling in. It's time to go have more wine, I think, right? It's amazing. What's glucose? Yeah, it's sugar. Uh, it's a processed sugar. Um, and the reason why uh, you use it is because of the viscosity that it has. Um, you could take something like corn syrup and use it the same way. Obviously, we don't want to use corn syrup that much anymore because of, uh, because of all the, the negatives about it and the <laughs> health issues that it has. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially a thickening sort of agent. You could make this, you could make this with sh- – glucose has, like, the thick texture to it without the sweetness necessarily. Hmm. Um, it does have some sweetness to it, but you can get it. I'm sure you can get it probably at uh, William Sonoma. Y- y- right? you, I don't think you can, actually. I was just going to ask Whole him, foods? like, where do we find glucose? <laughs> we'll have to, maybe. Yeah. She, you've got another question. <laughs> <In the hospital>. <laughs> <laughs> different types, different types. <laughs> That's a new sponsor today. I haven't heard about. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's, that's hysterical. I love it. At the hospital. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I am so happy you are all able to spend part of your day with us. Thank you so much. And I do need to thank the amazing sponsors of this event. We've got Cuisinart, which you put to the test today. <laughs> We've got Monogram Induction here in their ovens, which are incredible. And Whole Foods Market. And Paula LeDuc Catering has done all of the catering. So all of the prep and serving of the food you got to taste was done by Paula LeDuc. And then Minor Family Wines has been a huge part of this weekend as well. So thank you so much. And Gabby and Angela, thank you for sharing your story and chef Tim Hollingsworth thanks for coming Thank coming you. up <laughs> and taking time off from your life oh one other thing we have to share too I'm so sorry but that you he's got a segment coming out on Netflix that I know is going to be pretty amazing yeah November 20th can you just share it with us yeah, yeah no, November 20th um, there's a show that's going to drop they drop it in uh, all, they'll drop all 10 episodes at once but it's a uh, it's a show called The Final Table and it's basically um, a culinary competition 24 chefs from around the world competing uh, to have a chance to seat at the sit at the final table, which is um, built up of of uh, nine different chefs um, from Japan, Brazil, America, Mexico, England. Um, so it's pretty 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 incredible competition to be a part of, um, and I can't wait for you guys to check it out. Oh my gosh, can't wait to see it. So thank you, thank you everyone. I hope you have a great afternoon and that this was a fun part of it. Yeah, thank Thanks you. for coming. Bye. Thank you. Yes. Oh my gosh, that looks incredible. <laughs> I'm really sad.